in soccer, you know, we are in a, t a sport where you can get cut from so many different teams and things like that. But learning from a young age just to never give excuses and just to get better um, each day is something that I learned so early from both of them. And um, obviously the word can't and no was never allowed in my vocabulary. Um, I got in big trouble for that. So those were words that early um, in my childhood I was never allowed to say. And I think that that prepared me for life because now, you know, if anyone said that I can do something, I'd laugh in their face. Welcome. We have here today one of my dear friends, a national champion Seminole, a NWSL player, staple in the league, one of my dearest friends, one of the most amazing people whose smile always brings a smile to my face. Welcome to Two Wash Ups, One Pro, Carson Pickett. Yay! Wow. Thank you. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for dropping an hour with us. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Of Very course. Much. I can't wait. Awesome. So we'll just kind of like dive right in. We, we really want to just kind of offer a platform for players, pro players to kind of just tell their story and speak about what they want to speak about. Um, so <laughs> we'll just jump right in. I think I know the answer to this, but can you just talk about the one person who's had just the greatest impact, not only in your soccer career, but just as your development as a person? Yes. I mean, obviously both of my parents are amazing, but um, with my dad being a soccer coach, we had just such a special bond. So um, it's, it's always my dad um, with this question. And I just, I felt like so early in life, like it was something that we got to do together. And so I felt like it was um, an opportunity to just um, grow as people together and to learn so much from him. And honestly, like he's an amazing soccer coach, but I definitely have learned a lot more um, in life from him than I have really soccer. I mean, he's taught me everything I know in soccer, I'm pretty sure, but life, life skills to me, just now that I'm older, are so much more important. And I just feel like every day I'm around him, I'm growing more and more as a person. Oh, I just love that. He's amazing, amazing. I know I was lucky enough to um, go with you one uh, kind of a couple of days to go and help coach, coach with yeah. you and him. And I just love soaking up everything from him. He's just yeah. full of knowledge. And I, I really just love being around your parents, your grandparents. You, you come from just such unbelievable people. Well, they say the same thing about you. So thank goodness. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so he obviously has had such an incredible, um, you know, role in your career, in your life. I know your club, did he, was he your club coach as well? Yeah, so he started out at Ponte Vedra with um, my club team. And then actually my sophomore year of high school, he switched to a different club to have his own club team because he wasn't the head coach where I played at Ponte Vedra. And um, when he switched, obviously I was getting older, but I was playing up for so many years that um, I actually ended up switching my senior year of college because all the girls had left my um, junior year of college, actually, because so many girls, Morgan, Brian, Kylie Torres, all of them had left. So um, it, it felt like the right move to leave early. Obviously, I hated leaving them early just because they were like my best friends. We did everything together. So um, it was a big move, um, and, but it was very important for me um, going forward for um, getting ready for college and things like that because I needed to start being around, you know, different teammates who weren't going to be with me next year. And I couldn't take a year off um, and go find another team. So my junior year felt like the right time to move. Um, and yeah, I was, I was able to go to Creek's Clash, which is not the name now because we know club's crazy and they change names all the time and merge and things like that. But yeah, um, so I went with him my junior year and then we had two years of him being the head coach for high school and club. So we were always around each other um, for two years before I went to college. That's crazy. That's awesome. So um, we want to get a little deeper into your club club team because I went to Virginia, obviously. So yeah. I know about um, the dynamite team you guys had growing up. Um, and it's something that we're very curious about. But before we start on that, I'd love to know more about kind of growing up um, did you have like a moment where you really started to fall in love with the game that you knew this was something that you wanted to pursue beyond, you know, 
like just kind of being a hobby, you were like very serious about it. Can you kind of talk about the times in life where you first fell in love with the game? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so for me, obviously being from an athletic family, they wanted me to be in as many sports as possible. So I was in tennis, soccer, swimming, basketball. Like I did a million different sports growing up because they didn't want to limit me to something that they did. My mom obviously played basketball in college and my dad played soccer in college. So um, they figured it was going to be one of the sports, but obviously because my arm soccer probably was a little bit of the better choice. Yeah. But um, yeah, they just wanted me to explore um, this, my own sports and be able to see what I was good at. And, you know, honestly, in the very beginning, um, I did soccer because I just realized that I love team sports. Um, obviously, yeah. um, individual sports are a lot more lonely. And being an only child, I was like, I need more friends. I want more friends. I want to hang out with people. Um, so for me, that's that was a choice in the beginning to even start soccer because all of my really good friends were um, on these teams and we got to play with the boys and I just thought that was the most amazing thing growing up like to be able to beat boys was like so cool for girls so um that was something that uh a reason I started soccer and then honestly honestly as I got older we all know like there wasn't a, a pro league that was really making it so I felt like it was hard like you could you could watch the national team and things like that but it was like okay well if I play soccer it's only going to be till college and then what where like tennis was around and things like that um so I felt like that sort of kept me going in other sports track and field and I did tennis was my probably my second favorite, if not my favorite. I do love tennis. Um, but things like that were around and you were able to watch professionals on TV. And and right. I just remember um, watching TV and being like, where's soccer when I was younger? And I was, and it was sad to me. And I just like, I don't understand. And then I do remember sort of going back and forth and being like, well, you know, I want to play sports forever. When, you know, when you're 12, you, you think that I want to play sports forever, but soccer is going to end in college. So what am I going to do after that? Um, but as I got older and the pro league started to become a little more substantial and things like that, I felt like that's when my urge to like, just get out, train and fall in love with the game um, really started. And I right. do remember, can't remember what world cup it was, but I do remember uh, my dad and I, I was a little bit older, maybe like 12, 13. Um, but I remember we got up in the middle of the night because the World Cup was in a different country and we ate ice cream and just watched those games. And honestly, that was the time that I like truly fell in love with soccer. And I was like, this is amazing. Like what, a, what an amazing stage that they're on. Like so many people get to watch them and support them. Like people who don't even like soccer, you know, all of a sudden watch the World Cup. And I was like, that's just so incredible. And I think that that was a big moment and a turning point that made me be like, you know what? Soccer is my dream and I want to be able to play it forever. So I think that those two times um, were definitely in the moments that, you know, I chose soccer and then I realized soccer was something I wanted to do for a while. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny you bring that up because when you think about it, like, I mean, we're all near the same age. Yeah. It's so, it makes me so happy to know like the NWSL now is doing so well with CBS because it's true, right? When you're 12 and you can start to like see women that you aspire yeah. to be like on national television it's so important and I know for me like were you guys like I was like Mia Ham, Mia Ham. Yes. that was <laughs> the only person I could think of to reference soccer when I was growing up yeah. um which is why I mean I guess it just shows how far we've come um but yeah so we wanted to also talk about this club team right you Morgan Bryan Kylie Torres um ironically they both went to Virginia and you went to Florida State so you guys met up a lot in college as well as we know um, but what's cool about your story is like, you guys had such great success at the club level, which I think, um, is not always the case for everybody. And a lot of girls in your team ended up playing at big D1 colleges. Um, can you kind of talk about how, you know, you talked about your dad a bit and how he prepared you, but obviously going into a program like Florida state with, um, we know you were a four-year starter, so you were really successful, um, what the development as a youth player playing on a team like that, how it impacted your ability to kind of perform right away at the college level. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, that club team was just so special, honestly, on, on the field, um, some amazing players, but off the field, all such good friends. And I think that that bond um, was something that really drove that team to be successful. And I think, um, to be honest, I'm just going to compare it to now. I mean, now there's everyone starting their own club. So it feels like the club system now, everything's just watered down. 
Whereas yeah. you have so many options. Whereas, you know, back in the day, it was like people so drove. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But people drove like hours and hours to come play for our club team. And I think that that was something that was really special because, you know, it's now it's not like you're just pulling random people to just try and get numbers because it's so watered down. Like people drove three hours on weekdays when they had school the next day just to be on this team. And I think that um, that was really special just because obviously it was nice to have people outside of Florida. I mean, Morgan and Ansley Morgan and all of them coming from um, Georgia and things like that. And people coming from Alabama, like so many different states. And I just felt like um, we sort of had the best of the best from so many different areas. And I think that that was um, something that really helped us because um, in, honestly, another thing was we came from so many different high schools. So it wasn't like we were always around each other. So when we got together, it was like competitive and we were ready to go. Um, and I think that that definitely helped drive us to be the players we are today, just because um, we're so competitive. And that, that team honestly felt like um, that's what prepared me the most for college. Like the speed of play, like every aspect of soccer um, felt just better on that team than other teams in the area. So I think that, um, again, having so many different players from so many different states, we just got the best of the best. And that was able to prepare me the best um, with speed of play, especially because, I mean, and like Morgan and all of them, I mean, they're amazing players. Like to be able to be surrounded by them. And I think it helped me because they were a year older. So, you know, I think that matters even in, in high school when someone's a year older, their speed of play is already probably a little bit better than yours. So I think that that's why I wanted to stay on that team for as long as possible because I knew I was surrounded by legends um, in yeah. high school and club. I mean, I remember being, because we were, I think, two years, two or three years younger. Yeah. And y'all in that freaking yellow uniform. <laughs> yes. But I mean, because our games were staggered. We yeah. would always, you know, stay late and like watch this yellow team just rip it up. Um, so it was exciting you know just to. Sorry, yeah. it, it's so funny to think about too now because I'm like, I feel so out of it, and I know like the systems have changed with club. But did you feel like at certain age groups there was always like those three teams, right? Like they were like one team for one club at some point place in the country yes. that everyone knew about. Like I can think, book I played at Albertson in New York, but like. Crystal Dunn's team at Alberton was always like nationally known. And then you guys at Castle, like it's just so, and it's sad for me now that it's kind of watered down. Cause I feel like there was yeah. like these five teams yes. that everybody wanted to play. Cause you were like, this is it. This is the top of the line team. You know, if you play them, there's going to be like 20 coaches there. Yeah. And like, what's interesting too, what you said, Carson was about, you know, it being watered down is when we were growing up, coaches really, all the coaches went to just one event. Oh, exactly. So now it's like, now it's like where coach is going, like they're being pulled different areas, okay. different directions. But I literally remember like we would play, all the college coaches would be at our game. Then we, you guys would play, all the college coaches would move their chairs, turn around and sit and watch you guys. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, then there's only a couple showcases. It wasn't mm -hmm. like DA, ECNL, mm -hmm. regular or whatever it is now. I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's so true. There was just one good tournament every now and then. And it was like, the best place to find players yeah I remember just getting butterflies walking around like you'd be like oh that's that's so-and-so or like that's so-and-so and like yes it's just it's in the environment that like you're like yeah I'm on the right path like let's right. let's get after it and it just challenges you every time that you step on the field or walk walk the sidewalk in between fields yeah no exactly and I think that that's um another thing Tina like you said like I played with so many amazing players that they drew a lot of the college coaches for um younger players like me so it wasn't like you know as a freshman when I wasn't even getting really recruited or whatever it is now um Morgan and them were already getting recruited Kylie and Annie and all them were were drawing in the coaches and that really helped me as well because they got to see me a little bit earlier yeah, that's awesome. I love to hear that. Yeah, that's I, that, I it's true. Club soccer is not what it that's used it. to be. Um, but it's nice to reminisce on on the good old days. It is uh, people who understand. <laughs> yeah. So obviously you've discussed in in many different interviews, many things like that, but we really want to get give you the platform. Um I know we've had 3-hour coffee discussions <laughs> where we just talked about life and everything, but can you just kind of talk about the hurdles that you faced growing up, being an athlete, being just a kid with um, 
ear nub. That, I know that's yeah. what you like to call it. <laughs> yeah, my dad loves that. He tells everyone to call it that. Oh, yeah. he, he definitely yeah. him. Just kind of discuss just about your nub and kind of what it is, you know, the difficulties, you know, playing soccer, playing tennis, playing basketball. Just kind of talk about that. Yeah. Um, obviously, first, I just want to start off by saying, like, I have been very blessed. And um, my dad and I were actually running the other day, and it was a recovery run so we could talk. Um, and he was like, it's just crazy how God puts um, kids with people that he knows they're going to be there for them, and they're going to be able to raise them um, the best way possible and protect them. And I think that that was, is it my case, 100%. I mean, um, having athletic parents, I think helps because that was probably the biggest hurdle. Like, yes, I mean, kids are kids. Like just because I had one arm doesn't mean I'm the only kid ever to be made fun of or something like that. So I feel like so many people can handle the emotional side, but the physical side was something that I think would have been the hardest with people who don't really understand sports and, and things like that. So, um, my dad said on my birthday, he was like, this time, 27 years ago, we were crying in the hospital room. And then he said the next day we were like, all right, what do we got to do? Um, and I think that that's hearing those things, like, you know, they don't often say those things, but um, just hearing him say that just shows that they were, they were ready for anything. And obviously it was a big shock, but they were prepared, they, well, they were unprepared. And then the day after um, they were ready to take it on. And I think that um, that was probably the biggest part of my childhood was just my parents pushing me to be the best I can be and to not give excuses. And there was times that I, I would give a million excuses and they just wouldn't take it. So I think that that sort of um, allowed me to learn that there's just nothing that could hold me back. And if I put my mind to it, then I can do it. And I think that that's something in soccer, you know, we are in a, t a sport where you can get cut from so many different teams and things like that. But learning from a young age, just to never give excuses and just to get better um, each day is something that I learned so early from both of them. And um, obviously the word can't and no was never allowed in my vocabulary. Um, I got in big trouble for that. So those were words that early, um, in my childhood, I was never allowed to say. And I think that that prepared me for life because now, you know, if anyone said that I couldn't do something, I'd laugh in their face. Um, and I think that that was really special, um, for my parents and I, and just being an only child, I feel like it was amazing because they could give all their attention to me if I ever need anything. Some would say that's spoiled. I don't say it's spoiled, but um, yeah, just being able to have them to myself and to know that they're my best friends and to this day, they're still my best friends is something that has helped me so much um, as an adult. I mean, they helped me as a kid, but now being an adult, I can see how amazing they are each and every day. And I'm just so grateful yeah. and thankful for them. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so growing up, yeah, I mean, it was tough, just like any other kid. Um, luckily, I did go to a small private school where I had like max 40 in my grade. So being a soccer player and people seeing that I was athletic and could do anything, I really set my mind to. I, I didn't really get made fun of that I can remember, and I didn't get bullied and things like that. Um, but I think that that was because I went to such a small school and I was sort of surrounded by people that knew my story. Um, now looking back, I am grateful for that, but you know, it didn't really prepare me for college. Um, you know, when I stepped on the Florida State's campus, I was like, wow, this is like a whole nother level. Uh, I just couldn't, I, the size of it was just, it blew me away. And I think that it definitely scared me a little inside. Cause I'm like, you know, these people have no idea what my story is. Like, are they gonna accept me? Um, so I think that that was hard, but growing up, I mean, obviously I just remember riding a bike for the first time and taking my train wheels off and the amount of times I fell, I can literally remember and picture every single fall in my head. And since we all know Kylie, I was one time at Kylie's house and we were doing bike racing. I don't know why, but she lived in a cul-de-sac. So Kylie's super competitive. And she was like telling me all these rules that I had to follow on the bike. And so my parents and her parents were in the cul-de-sac we made it to the end and we turned around we we're on the way back and we were like so even we we're just seeing who was gonna win and my arm slipped and I literally flipped over the bike and I think that that like really like scarred me and I just remember being like it hurt obviously I was in so much pain but I just feel like emotionally I was like wow I'm really not like other people like Kylie had no problem on the bike and things like that so um, I had a lot of bike stories. So bikes aren't my favorite thing to do. If anyone ever says, let's go biking, I'm like, 
no, I think we're gonna have to pick another activity. But um, that was definitely the hardest thing for me growing up. But yeah, just things like that. I feel like because I didn't get bullied and all that, um, it didn't really affect me. But little moments like that, I was like, wow, I'm really not equal and even to anyone else. And I think that that was something that I definitely carried with me a little bit. Um, but again, if I ever expressed it to my parents, they were able to, to sit me down and tell me their thoughts about it. And it would always make me feel better. So I definitely was lucky um, to have both of them growing up and still to this day. I mean, I go to them for everything. So yeah, I think what's interesting too, and I don't know why this is always stuck when we've like had conversations, but you're obviously like severely left footed. Yes. <laughs> and yes. like, yeah. we've had this conversation where like, do you think you're actually left-handed? Like you said, you would reach for things like yeah. kind of go into that. Cause I think that's really interesting. That's so interesting. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I'm not a doctor by any means, but yeah, I seem to think because my dad's left-handed, left-footed, I'm left-footed. I seem to think that I was going to be left-handed. Um, people believe me when I say that. I have no idea, but I think- oh, well, you had me sold. Right, right. Okay, good, good. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, when I was younger, I definitely remember reaching for things. And when I carry bags after going grocery shopping, I always put them on my left arm and never have anything in my right hand. Like it's the most ridiculous thing. I just use it so much more than my right hand. And I think that that's something that people don't really understand. They're like, oh, you have one hand. Like, how do you do it? And I'm like, I actually use my left arm more than most people use their non-dominant hand. So that's something that I just feel like um, has He literally helped. throws a ball in better than me. <laughs> girl right here. Uh, I haven't done that. Really when you play you Florida State, I'm like, how she legit throws the ball farther than <laughs> oh, yeah. I do. I, I, I do practice oh. that sometimes, but I don't know that it's legal, but we'll see, we'll see one day. <laughs> Cocktail. Yeah, literally. I don't know that I don't have two hands, so I'm not sure that that's actually by the books. But um, yeah, I mean, I use my arm for everything. And I do think I would have been left-handed. Just yeah, I, like that. Remember, I remember you telling me that and being like, that's just the cool we I think we went on for like 40 minutes I literally was like so like do you go and she was like no like I reached for things with my left hand like I just thought that was fascinating yeah yeah I mean I seem to think that that's the truth but who actually knows but exactly I mean so many things when I was younger like my parents the very first time I, I was born in a hospital and I was the first baby that had one hand and so there's a group of doctors and there's like five doctors on the other side with toys. And this is when I was, um, they were trying to see if prosthetics is something that a kid would want to wear. And I just remember, well, I don't remember, my parents remember. Um, they put me on the other side of the room with all my toys where the doctors were with the prosthetic on it. And I'd crawl like one little step and I'd look at the, my prosthetic, I'd rip it off and then I'd crawl to the toys without the prosthetic. So I think they knew early that I was definitely going to be a bit stubborn with prosthetics and, you know, be able to do it on my own. But that's a story I'll never forget just because it's, it's so me now. Like I will never wear a prosthetic no matter what. And I think that they're amazing for so many reasons. And, you know, people who might struggle a little more with the looks of their arm and things like that. I mean, the way they make them is incredible nowadays. I have one that's cosmetic and it has the exact same veins as my right mm -hmm. hand. I mean, oh, it has wow. everything on it. It can paint the fingernails, but it just gets in my way. And I think that that's obviously real. It was really tough for me because I've learned everything with just my one arm. Yeah, you don't want anything holding you back and a prosthetic's just holding you back. For sure. I love that. <laughs> um, so kind of talk about, I think it's interesting because your whole life that, you know, you went to a small school, everyone, you know, knew who you were, knew your story. Um, as you got to FSU, obviously people started to realize, know your story. But last year, obviously, you know, that huge picture with Joseph blew up. Yes. And then everyone in the world literally knew about that, about you, about your story. Can you just talk about what impact that had on you and just your relationship with Joseph? Because for those of you, for those of you listening that don't know Carson, she's the one of, one of the most genuine people and the relationship between that I've seen between you and Joseph. One of the most amazing things about that is that you can see the genuine you know, connection between you two. And I think that's what a lot of people resonated with. So can you just discuss about your relationship with Joseph, how it started and kind of where, where it is and where you hope to kind of, you know, take it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, obviously that was massive for me and him last year. It was something I never would have expected. And 
I think, like you said, like we never would, would stage something like that just to become insta famous or whatever. And I think that that was something that, you know, caught me off guard and I'm sure his family and it caught my family off guard is like that people can see this picture and really resonate with it. And I, I think the coolest part about it is that um, I got to know not only him, but his family. And now they obviously live in Orlando and I'm able to go see him whenever, you know, not because COVID, but I'm able to go see him whenever I want. And I think that um, it would be special for him. Obviously he's so young that he's probably not gonna remember it fully, but you know, us having so many pictures and technology nowadays, social media, um, I'm so happy that we got the chance to connect and um, that Orlando brought us together. And I don't know, our bond just feels like, I just feel like he's my, such my friend. Like he's not like a little two year old or three year old. He's like, feels like my actual friend. Cause it's like someone that I can resonate with, like no matter if it's with words or just seeing each other, it's like putting our arms next to each other. It's just so cool. Um, and he just laughs and laughs and laughs every time we put our arms together. And I just, I love how much joy he brings to life. And obviously being 27 years old, there's so many challenges just with life in general, soccer and seeing um, such an innocent little boy um, feel like my friend is just brings life to me. And it just makes me smile and makes my heart happy. So our bond is definitely, um, you know, really real and raw. And I think that picture just shows that both of us are just so happy to see each other and meet each other and to be able to have a fan that feels like just my fan in the stands um, is something that, that's why I play soccer. That's not why I started soccer at all, but that's why I continue to play. It's just because I'm able to reach so many different people nowadays, um, again, with social media. And I think, um, you know, the picture just allowed me to reach different people throughout the world. And I think that that's the coolest thing is that, yes, I got to know Joseph and his family and that's amazing in itself, but to be able to now reach out and for people to reach out to me from different countries, like I can't even name all the countries that people have reached out to me with. And that is something that I, you know, I just hold so close to my heart because I just feel like people um, can resonate with a picture without even having one arm. Like they could have one leg, they could have, um, any type of quote unquote disabilities. And I think that um, them seeing two people with, you know, a quote unquote disability so happy gives them a reason to smile at least for another day, another week, another year. Um, so that, that picture was amazing and obviously um, brought a lot of attention to us. But again, I'm not someone who loves attention. So um, I'm, I'm still just loving the fact that I can reach out to people and people can reach out to me and have a clear communication with people who really need, need me yeah. and need inspiration. For sure. The, gen the, um, the genuine just love in it, I think just makes you just look at it and it makes you smile. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, and I love the, the fact that you brought up how as a young kid, you kind of were like, heck no to this prosthetic. Cause I, I think I would think looking from afar to see you as a professional athlete and see that you can do everything else, everything that everyone else in this field can do. And I think not having a prosthetic just proves that point. And so I'm sure you're so inspiring for people to watch, especially those that are also born potentially with part of their arm, not there. And, mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to also dive into, um, you briefly touched on Florida state. Um, I think it's kind of like, I'm not going to say hidden, but I don't think people realize, I mean, like you walked into a program that was at a national status and you started as a freshman and like sustained yourself all four years, um, which is not easy to do at a Florida state program. Can you kind of talk about how you were able to kind of so quickly integrate into the team um, and kind of earn playing time? Um, and then more talk about when potentially in your college career where like your professional career was more of a real idea and, and something you were really striving for through throughout your collegiate um, career. Yeah, of course. So stepping into Florida State um, was very intimidating. I just remember going on visits and, you know, being in North Carolina, it was like, oh, lovey-dovey, like off the field, of course, um, not on the field. And, you know, I felt like Virginia was like that, you know, they had a, a lot of um, fun and things like that. And not the Florida State didn't have fun, but it was very much business 24 seven. And I think that, um, you know, visiting there, I felt like it was home. 
I, I loved Mark. I loved um, the facilities, but the girls there, you know, they were striving to be pros and be four year starters. So, you know, anyone that comes in could easily take your spot at any point. So, um, it was a welcoming. It wasn't like the most lovey dovey welcoming, warm welcoming, but I knew that I wanted to step into a program that was going to take me to the pro level. And I just felt like um, Mark as a coach and the girls that were at Florida State when I visited, um, yes, it didn't seem like the biggest family, but I saw like that they were so driven to be professionals. And I think that that's something I knew I wanted to be surrounded by um, because in college, obviously going from high school where you always have your parents to college where you have no supervision and things like that. I mean, it's so easily um, distract, you, know, you can get distracted so easily in college. And I felt like Florida State was a program for me, just coming from a small school, um, where I didn't, wasn't going to go to college and be wild and crazy that I knew that I had to be, um, on point and ready for anything every single time I came to training. So that was the reason I really chose Florida State because it was just such a professional environment. Um, and, yeah, I mean, knowing that the pro leagues were so um, stable going into college, um, I then knew I definitely wanted to go to the pro level. And that again, that is why I chose Florida State. But um, being able to have people to look up to um, that I got to play with, you know, when I came in, those seniors were able to go to the pro leagues. And I just saw how much success they had and how many players Florida State put into the pro leagues. And I just knew I wanted to go down that route. Um, but I do remember when I was picking colleges, my de my parents would help me and they're like, okay, pros and cons to every college, like every parent does. And, you know, I loved this other school, um, but I knew it wasn't going to get me to the pro level. And Florida State, yes, wasn't as lovey-dovey, but I knew that I would follow my dreams at this school and they'd prepare me. Um, and I will say walking in as a freshman, it was the scariest moment of my life. Um, because those girls were like ready to get on the field so they could just take you down because no one loves freshmen coming in and maybe taking their spot. But I will say, you know, occasionally you hear stories about um, players who get their spots taken from, like by freshmen. And it's not often that you hear a positive story and that they really were there for that freshman and showed them the ropes. But I will say, um, the girl that was in my position when I came in, Jessica Price, um, she did continue to start for a little while. And I, and I just remember one training, I was just so eager to be out there. And she was like a six-year senior because she had so many injuries and things like that. But she had a long throw. And Mark loves a good long throw. So Yes, that man yeah. loves that thing. Yes. So there's always okay. someone with a long throw. And so she was like on the field for that reason, which like brings so much to the table. It's like a, it's like a um, corner kick. So I totally understood why in the beginning I wasn't starting, but I just remember sometimes getting so frustrated because I felt like I was just outworking everyone and, and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, I just don't get it. And I just remember her coming to me after one training and she goes, Carson, you have been unbelievable. And she goes, you deserve to be in front of me a hundred percent. She's like, obviously I have something special, like a long throw, but she goes, she goes, you, I just want you to know and to, for you to keep working hard because this is going to be your position at any point because I'm a six year senior. I'm leaving. I'm not playing the pros. Um, and I just want you to continue to work hard and not let this get, get you down. I mean, how many times is like a six year senior say that to a freshman? Almost never. Right. So I think that that was something that, um, sort of helped me with the rest of my pro league. I mean, my um, college career was just, you know, being open to freshmen and helping them because it's a big transition from high school, but getting that, um, you know, her communicating that to me and being so positive and reinforcing that I was doing great. And just to keep my head down and keep working harder than anyone, um, definitely helped me. And, and it helped me to work even harder because I knew that people believed in me. That's an awesome story. That yeah. really is. Cause you don't really hear that. <laughs> no, you, you hear it like once every 10 years or something. <laughs> it's normally like a horror story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got tortured or something. <laughs> I think it brings yeah. up the college or soccer at that level so much of it's mental yes. and like for as a freshman it's so easy like I hate to say you hit that slump but like even if you're playing it's so easy to get in your mind and then not perform um, and I can imagine like getting in minutes helped your game I always say game minutes are never you know you have to train hard but game minutes will always get you to the next level as a player you have to get real time experiencing yes. uh -huh. so that's that's great. I mean, God, everyone wants that girl. Everyone right now, <laughs> college player right now is like, dang, I wish my the girl I'm trying to be. 
that there would be that nice, you know? But yeah, I, 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 got, I got really lucky with her. I definitely you did. Did <laughs> you definitely did. So over the first, you know, four years of career, you've gone from NWSL um, right over to Australia in the W League without really taking a full off season. You know, you probably get a couple weeks here and there. But how are you able to sustain your body? And, you know, how are you making those sacrifices? Because I know you are so close with your family. How are you able to, you know, jump from <laughs> hemisphere to hemisphere, um, <laughs> coast to coast, literally, um, without and seeing to premise, you? people that don't know, the NWSL typically ends in October, if you're, you know, get to the end there and then these girls literally hop on a plane within two to three weeks they're in australia they play through the holidays they don't get off time to come home for holiday you know events and then they're literally home february and they're back in camp in march so these girls are going back to back like we're talking weeks in between seasons just to premise for anyone who doesn't know take it carson let us know how your body feels well <clears throat> yeah, if you would have asked me this when I was like 23, I'd be like, what do you mean, sucker? Oh my gosh, being 27 now, I'm like, Ugh, another gym session? It's like one per week and I'm like another one. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's definitely getting tougher as I get older, but um, you know, I just realized that I think it's harder on my body to be so fit and so ready and take three months off or four months off. I think it's actually way harder on my body to try and get back in that same shape I was in. Um, so it's sort of, again, pros and cons to continuing in the off season rather than taking a break. Um, my first year after Seattle, I came home and I took a couple weeks off, but I continued to train with my dad and things like that. But Tina, like you said, like game time is something that you just, you can't train for. I am telling you, it's the hardest thing. I feel like I'm so fit all the time when I'm taking some time off and I'm still running and, you know, doing some training every now and then. But when I get in the game, I'm like dead. And I'm like, well, what was I doing all those months? So I think that that's something um, I realized very early is that you can train all you want, but those game minutes, the second you step in a game, it's tough. Like you're struggling a little bit. So um, that was the decision really to go over there in my second year because I felt like um, I wanted to be in a team environment where I was pushed each day because again, four months off, I mean, even the most driven people, uh, it's tough to get out every day and train on your own with no one around you. And um, I think that that was the biggest uh, decision my second year was that I wanted to be in a team environment where I had to go to training each day. I had to continue gym and things like that because that just is what drove me and motivated me. So um, the first year was definitely tough. And I realized that going into my second year, um, you know, when I came home, I loved being home with my family. I'm so close to my family and it was the most amazing experience being home for Christmas and things like that. But you know, I sort of had to choose um, if it was sort of going to be my career or to be around my family a little bit more. And thank goodness I have the parents I do because they were encouraging me just to go follow my dreams. And they were like, you know, these are the moments that you'll never forget. And I think life-wise that helped me. And then soccer-wise, being able to get in a team environment, play games in the off season and get 90 minutes um, every week was something that really, really helped me going into the NWSL preseason the next year. Yeah. Well, this doesn't necessarily sound like this was your motivator, but I'm curious what your opinion is on this. Um, as many know, right, when you're, you know, even with league minimums improving and all that, the salary in the NWSL is not nearly where we hope it to be, you know, we're hoping for it to improve in time. Um, and I know this is also a narrative in the WNBA, how they also, a lot of girls are doing what you guys are. They're playing back-to-back seasons. They go to Europe or Russia or wherever. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious if you think a lot of girls, because there is a lot of girls in India still playing in, in Australia or other mm -hmm. countries during that time, if it's also a financial decision, um, just because obviously you're not being paid in that four month period, which is a significant amount of time. Um, and the W League gives you an opportunity to train while also earning an income. Um, I'm sure that, you know, somewhat played into your decision. Doesn't sound like it's mm -hmm. the whole, the whole story. Um, but I'm curious what your opinion is on that kind of, feeling like probably a lot of players are maybe in a position where they're like, well, I need to feed myself for four months and get training. And this is a free, not a free way, but a free way to get the training and then a way to also compensate my life. Um, yeah. yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's a great point. Yeah. I just, 
I'm so thankful first off for my parents again, because they still support me. Like they still pay some of my bills. And as embarrassing as that is to say, like, I just want to be honest and open about yeah. that is like, they still help me a lot to follow my dreams. And, you know, some people in the league, a lot of people in the league who are my dear friends don't have that. They don't have that um, support financially from their parents or their family as much. Um, and I know girls that have gone to Korea and things like that. I mean, places that not many people would go over there by themselves, but just to pay the bills. And I think um, I'm so thankful for the NWSL to be able to play um, in my home country and to be able to earn money for doing something I love. Um, but yeah, it was tough before we got paid year round. It was really tough for those four months to not get any income unless you went home and worked at a coffee shop or something. And I remember I subbed at my high school that off season because I'm like, I can't just sit around and do nothing. And I just didn't feel, cause I feel like I'm a pretty driven person. And I just felt like I was sitting at home, just, you know, not really doing anything training, but I was like, I have to start making some money. I can't just sit here any, any longer. So that is another reason why 100% I went over to Australia because, um, as I like to say, it is a paid vacation, to be honest. <laughs> you get to play soccer, you get to go to the beach, and you do get paid, and you get to do something you love. And um, I'm just so thankful for the NWSL, but I'm so thankful for other countries that cooperate with, this, with the NWSL to be able to have um, two different leagues that you can play in year round and to have that option. And I'm so grateful for my first coach in Brisbane who brought me over and gave me a chance because it was after my rookie year in the NWSL. I wasn't a big name. And, you know, she's like, I need a left back last minute. And she goes, and she told my agent, I had been watching. I went to one of her games when the Matildas were over here. And, you know, I, I like her. So she just, she gave me a chance. And she was one of the most amazing coaches I had, especially off the field. Like she just was so full of energy and um, I don't know. She just made my heart so happy when I saw her because she just loved soccer. And I think that going over there, um, we know the NWSL is so tough. And just going over to Australia really um, improved my love of the game. And it sort of brought my love back. Um, I was able to go be with, uh, meet a ton of new friends and be with a lot of people that I still talk to this day. And I think that that was, yeah, financially going to play 90 minutes and getting to be on a beach with, you know, new friends was something I was like, why would I ever pass this up? Again, <laughs> not seeing my family on Christmas was horrible, but you luckily- sweet grandparents. I know. Luckily, my first year um, I went over there, which I was still a little young, right out of college. So all five of them, uh, all four of them came over. Oh, so I got to see okay. them. Yeah. yeah, I got to see them. I had to walk them through the techniques of flying, you know, 24 hours. They wore the compression socks and everything, mm -hmm. took it's... the z -quil at the right time. So I definitely was able yeah. to help them through that. But that's a long flight for my grandparents. I mean, my you know, her well. grandparents yeah. are the cutest, sweetest. I mean, no wonder they, you know, <laughs> produced Carson. Uh, generationally like they are adorable yeah I've got to love you know supportive grandparents and um I actually visited Danny and Adelaide twice um yeah. that was like my birthday is the 27th of December I was like I just need you guys to help me figure out how to pay for this ticket and yes. that's all I want for my birthday and I went and I'm like this I get why they do it now it's so amazing but I appreciate yeah. your transparency with the financial stuff because as much as you guys have, the league has become so professional, right? We have Nike and all these things. And like, we watch you guys and it's like superstars on the field. A lot of girls are still, you know, unfortunately to this day, working side jobs, even while playing in season, not even out of season. So um, hopefully that will change in time. We recognize part of that's just like the league having to grow. Um, it's not, you know, an easy one issue, but um, I appreciate the transparency because I think that's something that people don't know about. Um, and it's so important to highlight because it just shows, you know, how resilient you guys are. And frankly, like, I don't know, I think women are incredibly powerful and to be able to put your bodies through that for so much time, it just shows how strong we are. Um, but to end, we like to do, um, My some favorite. rapid fire questions, which is oh, singer, <laughs> if you're up for that, um, okay. you don't have to like immediately respond but we we try to do rapid fire questions um in fact i'm telling i need to tell joanna this we need to like compile everybody's at the end of the season um yeah. with the podcast and see what's well, interesting um, because 
we've had like very similar answers on like weird, a let's couple see, of let's weird see. questions. Yeah. Ooh, let's I'm see. Excited. yeah. All right. Favorite coffee drink? Um, pumpkin spice latte. Okay. Well, we're in season. <laughs> um, describe yourself in three words. Um, tan. Yes. <laughs> smiley. I don't know. That's word. Yes. And um, inspirational. Yes. Love it. Agree. Very. Favorite NWSL team to play? Ooh, Portland. It's got to be okay. Portland. Okay. Yeah. That's a new one. At Portland? At Portland? At Portland. Oh, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Okay. Okay. We haven't been getting that, but I, now, I've been waiting for that answer because that's for yeah. sure that's a fun experience. Um, current favorite takeout during Ooh. COVID? Thai. I love Thai. Yeah. Uh, favorite dish in Thai? Just curious. Ooh, um, pad Thai. Same. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Um, television show you've recently binged? Atypical. Okay. New one. That's a I new one. That. I haven't seen that one. I think that's what it's called. Wait. Um, favorite teammate. And we recognize this is people get sensitive. We know this changes by the day, but who's today's, who's your favorite teammate today? Havana Salon. She's one of my best friends. Um, I was just with her in Cyprus. So, you know, she's, she's up top on the list because she, she's my best friend. And I honestly went to Cyprus to be with, to be with her and to play soccer with her again. So that's so fun. That's awesome. Well, Carson, we appreciate you. We love you. Um, thank you so much for hopping on with us and, you know, sharing your story because it's such an inspirational one and, you know, everyone I think needs to hear it. Thank so you. We thank you. Carson. Thank oh, you. Thank you. This was so fun. I appreciate you guys having me.